Hey there, and welcome to the Made by Google podcast. I'm your host, Rashid Finch, and this is the podcast where we take you backstage at Google and get the insights from the folks who built the products you use and love. Now, this week is all about security. What does Google do to keep users safe, especially on mobile phones? You have that thing on you all the time, so keeping it secure is extremely important. What is the biggest threat these days? And also, where does Google's job on security end? And where does yours as a user start? We're discussing all these topics today with someone who is a top expert on the topic. He's the director of Android Security Strategy. Please say hi to Eugene Leiderman. Eugene, welcome to the Made by Google podcast. Please tell us a bit more about your role and how you ended up at Google. Yeah, thank you. So I've been here almost five years. It'll be five years in April. I'm the director of Android Security Strategy. Primarily, I focus on external evangelism. My team participates in a lot of security standards. Right. And we do a lot of certification work of our products and help our partners certify their products to help build trust. Prior to Google, I was at VMware uh, for a couple of years. And prior mm-hmm. to that, I was actually at a company called Good Technology. I've worn every hat you can think of. I've been in product management, product marketing. I've even had a couple stints working for the government. So what's really neat is I started my career kind of working on more backend infrastructure, pre-cloud, right? So more of sure. traditional IT information systems. And as I've evolved in my career, it's kind of moved from cloud to mobile down to now at this point, the mobile OS. Great. Now, uh, listeners of the Made by Google podcast know that I usually go to the internal directory of Google, you know, where I see the personal mission statements of people. Uh, yours is the longest one we had to date. I think it had like a length limit in the past, but we <laughs> let go of that and you made sure you use that. It says, build trust with consumers, developers, our OEM partners, key IP informers, and enterprises around Android security and privacy capabilities through outreach, transparency, and independent validation. I guess that basically covers everything. There's nothing left out there, right? Exactly. It's uh, it's comprehensive, I think. Today's guest has dedicated his career to cybersecurity. Eugene Leiderman has been fighting the good fight on all levels and on all sorts of computers. Cloud ones, virtual ones, and now mobile ones at Google. As a director of security strategy, it's his job to make sure Google does the right things to make sure all Android users are well protected. That goes from things you might see, like Google Play Protect, to things you don't, like encryption. And as you'll hear, working on security at Google means making sure you as a user can enjoy the nice things, while Eugene does the heavy security lifting for you. Just don't ignore those red lights. I hope you'll enjoy our conversation. So let's start our discussion with transparency, because maybe that's not the first word you kind of think about when you think about security. So why is transparency important to keep people safe? First and foremost, transparency builds trust. I mean, in any relationship you have with other people, being transparent is a good thing. I actually apply that in my own personal life. I I try to be very transparent with my wife, my kids, and everybody else. It doesn't mean I come off rude. I try to be nice. Uh, but I definitely try to be transparent. Uh, a really good quote actually comes from the Dalai Lama. Mm-hmm. A lack of transparency results in a distrust and a deep sense of insecurity. So it's something that we just try to abide by. That's a good point. And you're right that that's uh, not only for personal relationships, but I guess being transparent in how we treat people's data or the things we do to keep the data safe, people will want to know about it. Yeah, the other big thing is, I mean, as you know, Android is open source. Mm-hmm. That's a really big factor for transparency. If anybody wanted to, they can simply review the changes that are being made. Actually, it helps us uh, work really closely with the research community. We publish a lot of content. We even publish a quarterly transparency report that has top line metrics for things like malware and device updates. And we're always trying to provide more information to all of these target audiences that I mentioned above, right? So it's consumers, key opinion formers, developers, OEM partners. So, you know, that open source side of Android always confuses me a little bit because, you know, on one hand, of course, people can see if, you know, that is the ultimate form of transparency, I guess. At the same time, if you're a bad guy, you can probably figure out, you know, where is Android's weakness and then exploit that. So how do we keep that in check? Honestly, the the way I look at it is the fact that it's open source means we have a lot more people protecting Android, right? When you're you're running a proprietary closed source system, uh, there's not a lot of eyes on it. It's kind of hard to scrutinize. It's a lot of people refer to it as security through obscurity. 
you know, transparency does shine a light, but that light means we have more people looking at it and partners protecting. So that means security researchers, academia, other uh, security companies, you know, everybody's trying to do the right thing and protect the user. And so if you actually look at some of the high benchmarks when it comes to security, especially on mobile, Android devices achieve some of the highest ratings. Uh, we've gone through a lot of Android devices are approved for military use in the US and other countries. So, I mean, it, it doesn't hold it back at all. I think it actually uh, strengthens it. So we're now talking about the lower levels of security, as it's often called. We, you know, we're, we're talking about the operating system, basically the hardware. What are some of the things people should be aware about when they think about their security, specifically for mobile devices? Yeah, uh, smartphone technology has evolved greatly over the years. I mean, there's a lot of things I would call below the surface. The user never sees. They're just there and running. You know, obviously devices have encryption. That, that encryption is usually uh, hardware backed, right, on these devices, not to go super technical, but there's usually a harder route of trust. And mm -hmm. that is used for key primitives, like generating encryption keys for the entire device, protecting your biometric secrets when you use to authenticate to the device, ensuring that the integrity of the operating system is there. And as you kind of move up the stack, the OS does a lot as well, right? So the OS isolates everything. So, you know, everybody talks about app sandboxing as a good example. Sandboxing basically means that every single app and process is isolated from one another. Mm -hmm. You know, it has its own dedicated CPU cycles, access to memory, access to storage. And the only way it really communicates with the system is through permissions. And then it can communicate with other apps as well. But it's all isolated in a way so that kind of guarantees everything is separate from one another. Right. So if one app runs into trouble, security or otherwise, it won't affect another app. That's the general goal of it, exactly. Right. Okay. So you were talking about things we don't see. Maybe something that we do see as a user, if we sort of move up the stack to keep people safe, is Google Play Protect. Maybe users, you know, of course they know Google Play, that's where they get their apps from. But what is Play Protect and how does it work? Play Protect is the most widely deployed anti-malware solution. It's installed on over three and a half billion devices. Wow. It scans over 125 billion apps every single day. And that formula is basically if you take the number of devices, multiply that by the number of apps they have on the phone, it does a daily scan of all those apps. It's both an app on the phone, but it's also a whole backend infrastructure. So every app that gets submitted into play mm -hmm. goes and gets scanned through Play Protect. It does a bunch of things. There's static analysis, dynamic analysis. It uses a lot of machine learning to analyze patterns and so forth to see what's going on with these apps as they're submitted. Uh, there's heuristics, signature checks, heat maps. The user doesn't know that because when they go to the Play Store, they install an app. The last thing it will say is, oh, scan, you know, scan by Play Protect, and then it downloads it to the device. Now, that's just before it ever gets submitted into Play. Of course, it also, as a user, you have an app on the phone, Play Protect uh, service, rather. Yep. And you can get to it from the Play Store or from the settings of the phone. And you can always run a manual scan. It works offline as well. And it basically will show you that, you know, you have no malicious apps on your phone. It also actually scans if you do side, uh, side load or download outside of the Play Store, it will scan those as well for your, on your device. So it's, it's fairly comprehensive. Now, you mentioned machine learning in your answer. Uh, machine learning, AI, two topics we talk a lot about on this podcast. So how is that beneficial to something like Play Protect? Yeah, I mean, anything that you want to do at scale, right, you're going to be leveraging machine learning. And you, you kind of hear this across the board. I mean, obviously, I know it's, it's very popular now because of what we're talking about, chatbots and everything else. But mm -hmm. overall, I mean, it's, it's been used in, in security products for, for a long period of time. It's used across all of our product suites, right? We're, we're always using machine learning and training the various models to understand, to be able to pick things up at scale and, and detect. And so this is not just a play protecting, actually. Um, it, it applies to what we do for anti-phishing uh, as a good example across all of our uh, first-party apps as well. Well, let's talk about phishing because that is definitely a topic I think people are worried about. It's maybe one of the larger threats, if not the largest. Is it perhaps the largest threat you could face on a mobile phone? Honestly, I think at this point, phishing has overtaken malware, especially during COVID. It went really bad. I think uh, phishing spiked heavily. And this was there's lots of research that it was across even enterprise and consumers. In fact, there was a study cited by CNBC that said in 2022, phishing uh, on mobile went up like 50%, phishing and identity theft or attempts. And the, the reason for that is because if you look at a traditional legacy medium for phishing, it'd be your laptop or your desktop. Okay, well, you're connected for a little bit of time. Mm -hmm. You put it away. Your phone, you're always connected on your phone. Your phone's always, at least in my case, it's always in my pocket or next to me. And so you're going to get a message. You're going to open it and see that message and, and try to respond and do something with it. Now, the, a phone is also a much smaller surface. So as a screen, it's a little bit harder to discern 
if it's a, a phishing message, right? You have to really read through it. And, and so I think this is why it's become such an important area to focus on. So how do we do that? I guess, so phishing is maybe someone sent you a link, you click it, maybe you shouldn't have done that. And then we sort of got to make sure nothing bad happens. So, so how do we approach that? Let's start with like, what it, like you said, what is phishing? Well, phishing could be, you know, a way to try to could fool a user into getting something out of them or for them to do something. That could be sending a link to install malware, if you remember like Cluebot, making them think that they have to log into a website and put in their username and password, right? And steal their credentials. I think the cool thing that we provide on Android is this out-of-box protection. So historically, it was all email-based. A lot of people would get phishing emails. Well, Gmail blocks 99.9% of those. And I think it, the latest stat that we talk about is it's like 10 million every second that we uh, block in terms of scam. Wow. Talk about scale, right? Powered by ML and AI. But a lot of those phishing attempts have moved to text-based, right? So with Google Messages, we actually also have built-in uh, scam and phishing protection. And so what, the way that works is it looks at basically the reputation of the sender, the reputation of the URL that the sender might send. And actually it's using ML to look at the patterns of the message itself to understand if it's a suspicious message and it'll flag it. And what's really nice about the way it works is it makes it really easy for the user not to have to worry because as it starts detecting it, it'll start moving it to a, a out of your inbox, out of sight, out of mind. You don't have to sit there and freak out and be like, is this an important message or not? And some other operating systems have a much more uh, blunt approach of saying, let me just block all unknown senders. Well, what happens in that situation? What if you get a text from your pharmacy or from your doctor or a one-time passcode being sent to you? You might miss all of that important information. So you want to have a good balance there. And the same honestly applies to voice-based, right? Like mm -hmm. message-based is popular, but voice-based phishing is also coming back. And so there's lots of great deterrence there with dialer, right? You have uh, caller ID and spam protection. And then my one of my favorite features, not available everywhere, but I love call screen because at the end of the day, you know, uh, the people that run these phishing campaigns, they're a sales organization. They have quotas, they buy leads. And so if you can deter them, time is money. So call screen is a great deterrent because it kind of stretches that conversation out. And call screen is where, where just, just to be sure, call screen is where the Google Assistant answers the phone on your behalf first, right? Yes, exactly. And it's done in a privacy preserving way. The, the last thing I want to say is it's really all about layered security. So let's just use the message as example. Mm -hmm. I get a text message, it's a phishing link. As a user, we're so used to seeing warnings, we ignore warnings. Right. Sometimes, at least some users. Mm -hmm. And so you, you see the red warning. It says, don't click this. This is bad. User ignores that warning, clicks it. It opens up Chrome. Well, Chrome leverages safe browsing, which is also leveraged across 5 billion devices. And with safe browsing, it will actually also detect phishing and malicious websites. So then when that link is open in Chrome, you'll see this big red warning as well saying, hey, don't click this. Right. But let's take it even a step further and say they did ignore that warning too. And they click it. Chrome will, of course, warn them not to download anything malicious. And let's say that in this case, they, install, they try to get prompted to install malware. Well, then that's when Google Play Protect kicks in, right? So it's really this kind of layered security approach. That That's a lot of layers. And that all starts in this case with messages where I, I wasn't actually aware of it, but there is, like you have in Gmail, a, a spam folder with text messages that you probably have never seen uh, and for good reason. But even if you would see it, you would click on the link, you would uh, maybe open Chrome, uh, safe browsing, which basically is a very, very, very long list of websites that, you know, no normal person should want to go to. And then even if you still get there, well, you, you, you need to go to a great length to get uh, malware on your device through this way. Yep. And and one other thing that just to lead to back to, like, so like, like I said, is phishing either makes you try to install something bad mm -hmm. like to compromise your device, or in this case, try to steal information from you. Mm -hmm. And so I think this is another great example where if you look at all the identity protection features that you have on your phone that are powered by Google, really, right? So a good example, one is password manager, right? So the mm -hmm. fact that you do have the ability to generate and store passwords, and it will actually alert you if any of your passwords have been compromised. The other thing that you have is because your Gmail account is so important to everything you do, one, you can protect it using two-step verification. Sure. You can get a one-time passcode. Or my favorite feature is phone as a security key, where I actually use my phone as a physical security key. And that that is impervious to phishing attacks. And then the, the last piece is you have this account and security checkup feature. So literally, if somebody ever tries to log in as you from anywhere, you'll get a pop-up on your phone, notifying you can see all your recent activity in terms of logins from where they happened. You can revoke access right away. It really gives you that central place and it actually all ties together because if you look at on Pixel devices and now on other Android phones, 
we have really unified the security and privacy settings on the phone. Mm -hmm. And so you can see all of that in one place. And it gives you this really nice, simple kind of green, yellow, red view of what your cybersecurity hygiene looks like on your phone. You don't need to be an expert. You just see that information. And then you can actually see that information directly from the notification center as well as a quick AI action. So it, you know, oh, hey, you have a password but that you need to potentially change because it's on the dark web somewhere. Okay, cool. I did that. My status is green and I feel good again. I think I'm green. I'm not green. I'm orange. I got to do something after after our conversation. Yeah. That's interesting. So yeah, that that's the security center in your Google account. Definitely worth checking out as I just found out actually something uh, definitely that I needed to do. You just mentioned something that I find so interesting is, so sometimes we see that in the news once in a while, a website, there's a leak and passwords leak, and then they are in the hands of criminals. And if you reuse your password on multiple websites, that could be pretty dangerous, right? Because now people, those criminals could have access to other websites. You mentioned that Chrome or Google will notify you in a case such a thing happens. So how does that work and where do I get that notification? Yeah, it's it's actually built in. So without going to, into the weeds, just think that it's it's basically monitoring all the passwords. I mean, generally it uses the hashes of the passwords, obviously, to, to check for the passwords. But the way it will work is it monitors that and there's a couple of ways that you can get access to it. But the easiest is through the security and privacy settings and that notification center mm -hmm. where it just automatically tells you. And that's in your example, that's why it's orange. It's saying it's saying likely you have one password that's been on one of these lists because there's always these dumps of compromised passwords and it's on the list and it will remedy for you to change it. The other cool thing that I think you'll see a lot of over the next couple of years, especially because it launched last year, is the use of pass keys, which is moving away from passwords, right? There's this new passwordless technology right. uh, using a FIDO standard and public key infrastructure. And so, you know, you'll see, I think, a lot of more apps on phones starting to move away and all the major operating systems have announced support for pass keys. So that is, I create an account with maybe a social media network and I just use my fingerprint, for example. That's right. Under the hood, there's more. But as a user, that's all you kind of see exactly. And it's transferable across devices and everything. Okay, and and I've never been asked then to come up with a password in the first place and store it somewhere. But until there's better adoption of that, I think you know, leveraging, for example, your Google Google identity for single sign on to other services and ensuring that your Google identity has two step verification and better than sending yourself a text message. I think that's probably the biz. You know, use the Google Authenticator app or, like I said, use phone as a security key, which is a really really cool feature. And of course, you also have these like almost actual keys that you put on your on your keychain. Yes. Well, that's the thing. Phone and security keys using the same uh, FIDO U2F standard, but it's relying on the hardware of your phone instead of having to pay and carry a physical key. So I have one of those. I have a physical key. I have a couple sitting in my home, but my phone is my security key. So anytime I'm on the go, it's just I use my phone. So this is almost more of a philosophical question, but if you look at security, keeping users safe, if a user then gets into trouble, do you feel... Is it like on the on the industry or is that the user's fault? We want to make it as easy for users as possible. So I think the thing that we do, we provide really good out-of-the-box security, right? So we have all these services running out of the box to protect the user. Of course, users can ignore lots of those things. They introduce their own risk. Mm -hmm. So there's, I think there's a relationship there and a balance. And the one thing I would recommend to users is one, leverage all of these things. And two, you know, try to read up on some of the, the tips and tricks in terms of you know, we make it easy for you. Obviously, Password Manager will recommend a new password for every single website that you uh, set up an account for. Do that. Don't don't go against the grain and try to say, oh, I'm going to use the same password, right? Or, you know, if you get an alert, make sure you're actionable. It's kind of like going to the doctor, I think, mm -hmm. to some degree. If you linger and you don't take care of issues that are early, you might be much more sick. But if you follow the guidance and the security and privacy settings, so for you, you have that orange, you should act on it before yeah. it turns red. Definitely. That, that that's a very good analogy. Yeah. Let's let's make it all green in the in the next hour or so. So uh Eugene, we close every episode with a top tip for our listeners, something they can do immediately, maybe in this case to 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 become more safe. I have a sneaky suspicion which direction this is going to, but please enlighten us. What's the top tip for our listeners this week? Yeah, I mean I I, I think I gave it away already. Uh I should have saved it for the, for the ending. Uh, but I definitely think that just leveraging what's available on these devices. So, you know, I highly encourage making sure that you have a scam protection turned on in Google messages, 
leverage things like call screen and dialer and caller ID and spam protection, which they're on by default, by the way. So, and then if you see a red warning, red means stop, doesn't mean go. So definitely follow the warnings that you see on your device and leverage the security and privacy settings section on your phone if it's available to you. Like I said, it's available on Pixel and a bunch of other devices already and uh, hopefully rolls out to more devices over time. But if not, you know, obviously you can still go to the settings page and see that. Also, there's other cool features like privacy dashboard if you want to know what apps are doing on your phone in terms of like what, what they're having access to in terms of permissions. You have that available as well. So just kind of be astute of what's going on on your device. And it's, it's, a, t- it's a team battle, right? We're, we as Android and Google are here to protect, but the user has to do their part as well. Yeah, and it sounds like you do all the heavy lifting, so all the user has to do is not ignore red warnings, and uh, and everyone will live a better day, it sounds like. Exactly. I think that's the thing to think about is if we do our job really well and make security not scary and kind of leave it just a couple decisions to you, you should enjoy your phone for all the cool stuff, like taking great pictures and watching videos and enjoying all the fun things you can do on your phone. Don't worry about all the scary cybersecurity stuff because we're you know we have your back. Well, we're glad we have you to have our backs and uh, make sure Android and uh, all, all those phones are are kept safe and all the Google accounts as well. Eugene, thank you so much for joining the Made by Google podcast today. Thank you. It's a pleasure. Well, I hope you are doing what I'm doing, and that's doing the security checkup in your Google account or on your mobile phone, just to make sure everything is all green and all right. Love hearing from Eugene how much work we do to keep you safe and how we use multiple layers of defense so nothing is left to chance. I'm so grateful you joined us for this episode of the Made by Google podcast. If you're not a subscriber yet, maybe this is a good time to make a change. Just hit subscribe or follow or whatever it's called in your podcast app and make sure you don't miss another episode of the Made by Google podcast. Thanks again for listening. Take care. Talk to you next week.